about why you should uh, listen to us. <laughs> um, so again, as I said, I work for IGNW. We're a services only full stack systems integrator, uh, really focused on helping customers across the, uh, the landscape with things from application modernization, hybrid and multi-cloud data analytics, um, DevOps and automation. And um, as such, we've done this a couple of times. Uh, and by a couple, I mean probably hundreds for customers. So we've helped deploy and manage Kubernetes at scale for uh, some of the, the world's largest companies and uh, and have kind of learned a couple of lessons along the way and have gotten some battle scars. And so uh, anytime we can help share some of those learnings with the community and help uh, share some of our tricks, we're happy to do that. So um, let me go ahead and Kendall, you want to tell us a little bit about Fairwinds? Yeah, well, and I would just add that's 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 what we're hoping to help you with today is, um, you know, both John's company and my company have learned a lot of things the hard way. You can go learn things the hard way, but you'll save yourself a lot of headache by uh, listening to folks who already have those scars. So um, about Fairwinds, we are a Kubernetes enablement company. So we offer services, open source and software in this space. Uh, our services are primarily focused on build and maintain Kubernetes infrastructure. Um, if that's a lot of like, here's my infrastructure problem, make it go away, we can build that and maintain it for you. Um, open source, because we're managing lots of infrastructure at scale across lots and lots of clients, we are regularly seeing, hey, this is a macro problem that everyone has. So we'll go write a tool that solves that, that helps us with our service and is also beneficial to the community. We're gonna be talking about one of our open source projects here today. Uh, and then finally, software, we do have, um, SaaS products that are often leveraging open source underneath, but uh, if you want to be sure that you're using Kubernetes correctly, um, we have a software solution in there for you as well. But uh, go ahead. Okay, so let's dive in and, and just at, at a, as a level maker, um, talk about what's new about Kubernetes. So part of the reason we're having this conversation, getting configuration is e getting configuration right is very easy if you're using something that you're very familiar with. Part of the reason that it's difficult and part of the reason we're talking about this today is not that Kubernetes is inherently infinitely more complex than other technology out there, although there, you know, there's some argument that it is sufficiently complex, uh, but a big part of it is just, it's a new paradigm. Everything about Kubernetes is new and sort of different. It's a different way of thinking about the world. It is sort of cloud reaching maturity in some ways, but um, it's a very different world from when you had a data center and you could walk around the room and you could flip servers off, flip them on. Um, and you know, I think John has been in this industry long enough. We can both look back on times where, you know, as a sysadmin, you had one server that you, you know, you could go in and look at the uptime and it'd be like, uh, you know, 783 days and you'd be super proud or 15 years and you'd be super proud. And um, Kubernetes doesn't even attempt to do that. Everything is ephemeral from the get go, ephemeral meaning built to come and go. Um, and I mean, anything you want to say about that, John, before I get into uniform APIs? Okay, so yeah, that the okay. other thing is, um, one of the things that Kubernetes makes really different is it does enable uniform APIs across clouds, across your data center. So everything below Kubernetes still has to be configured to run on that hardware, be that in AWS, be that in Google Cloud, Azure, your data center, one of the other clouds. Um, but once you've got Kubernetes there, there's a uniform API for just about everything. And people do run their compute there. There's a way to run serverless in a uniform way. There's a way to put your databases there. There's questions about all of those different things, but uh, it gives you a uniform API that people really like having that uniform API across different locations. So if you're running Kubernetes in lots of different places, it's easy to just go leverage Kubernetes and go from there. So it's all new, it's all different, and that's part of why we're talking about this today. But once you do understand the basics, it's relatively easy from there. Go ahead, John. So yeah, and, and as Kendall said, right, a, a lot of organizations, because this is new, um, they really start off with, I have a Kubernetes, right? I have a single cluster, I have a sandbox, yeah. uh, now what? And so um, with that, it you know, it's, definitely convenient and it's fairly easy to man manage that configuration manually, just like with the servers of old, where I could log in and make changes to a config file. I can do a lot through the Kubernetes uh, CLI. I can do a lot through the API directly, um, but that's kind of 
where it ends from a from an experimentation perspective. And Kendall, can you kind of tell us some of the areas where you've seen customers start to run into problems with with that? Yeah. So I mean, I think it's you know the first time you're you're kicking the tires on Kubernetes, probably the most likely way you're going to do that is log into one of the clouds spin up one of the managed clusters, hop into the GUI, click some buttons and try different things, right? But it's it's one thing if you're kicking the tires with it that way, if you're at your company and you have your first Kubernetes cluster and it's entirely configured through a GUI, uh, again, nothing necessarily inherently wrong with that, but what happens is when you wanna go spin up the next one, you can't remember all the buttons you clicked. You can't remember all the things you had. And so what we see is companies who spun up one Kubernetes cluster and they have one guy who remembers all the configuration they had, or maybe wrote it all down to go spin up the second cluster. And then pretty soon, you know, they're three years on and there's one person in the organization who remembers all of the configuration because none of it was documented in his code. It was all done manually. Um, and you have a person as a massive single point of failure, um, and let alone when you have organizations that start that way and maybe even wrote all their uh, configuration down as code, but as they start to spin up their third cluster or their 15th cluster, or they've enabled the company to spin up clusters wherever they want and suddenly there's 150 clusters across the entire organization with no uniform anything and it's all insecure and oh my gosh, you're a financial institution and what are we even thinking? Um, I wish that I was making up that scenario and it wasn't uh, reality, but uh, these are things that actually happen. They are, um, yeah. Unfortunately, those are problems that real customers have come to us with uh, in the past. And the good news is, is that um, the community, you know, this isn't an this isn't an unknown problem to the community. So uh, there's a CNCF project out there called Flux. It's a great project uh, for those who aren't familiar with it. I highly encourage you to take a look at it, install it. It's not the focus of our talk today, but I do want to talk about it because it's a building block of how we see managing configuration across the enterprise from a Kubernetes perspective. Um, so, you know, it's uh, you know, first of all, it, you have to buy into GitOps. Um, <laughs> ultimately, Git becomes the source of truth, and Flux is a tool for the automation of Kubernetes objects from Git at its very core, right? Uh, so it does some things really, really well. It solves some of the challenges that Kendall just talked about. Specifically, it allows us to deploy Helm charts, customizations, which is a for, for those who aren't familiar with customize. Um, it's a a language for um, applying patches on top of uh, Kubernetes objects, or even just bare Kate's manifests directly to our cluster by committing those as code to Git. And so we have a kind of a, a I'll walk through here, kind of a use case on how we can use Flux. Um, and then we'll talk through how, uh, how that becomes a really good solution for managing configuration, but uh, and it, it helps us keep those clusters synchronized, but it doesn't really solve for uh, best practices, right? And for specifically for highlighting or, or preventing folks from doing things that uh, that that violate kind of in, you know call it community best practices around uh, creation of my deployment and creation of my uh, my Kubernetes objects. So, real quick, I'm going to go ahead and pull up a demo and uh, kind of walk through how Flux is. Uh, useful. So in this case, um, I actually have several Kubernetes clusters already created. I have two staging clusters and a production cluster. Now, historically, if I wanted to say create a namespace on my staging cluster, I would just do something like kubectl, create ns, you know, testing one, and wait a few seconds, and then I would do kube. Uh, and I would see my testing one namespace right here, which is super handy. Um, but as you start to scale clusters, whether they're multi-region and you need to have multiple clusters in multiple regions, whether they're different security enclaves, whether they're just multiple clusters for different workloads, right? There's a lot of reasons why you might need more than one cluster. Um, keeping those name things like namespaces and RBAC and different deployments and everything in sync across all of those clusters starts to become daunting and at a point, right, there's a point of a huge point of diminishing returns where it's almost unmanageable. And so uh, using something like Flux, we can, of course, keep all of the, uh, the, the configuration of the cluster itself, the deployment of things into the cluster as code, manage it through Git. So in this case, I have an info repo here, um, which you'll see on my screen. And if I just jump into my staging environment, and this is the route that my Flux install in my staging clusters uses. 
um, I've got a namespaces.yaml file here. So if I wanted to create a namespace on my staging clusters, I can come in here, and this is just a, um, I'm gonna copy paste so I don't typo this again. Um, this is a, you know, just a standard Kubernetes object, right? Just a standard YAML file. Um, you can get sophisticated. These can be Helm charts, they can be customizations, et cetera, but they, you can also just start with bare uh, YAML. And I'm gonna create the testing namespace. So then I'm going to get commit adding test namespace. I'm gonna push that up to GitHub. Just, just to stop you for a second here, John, yeah. what you're doing, you have an infrastructure repo and you're just making a change to that infrastructure repo and applying it. And that's that's all that you've done so far, right? Correct. So all I've done so far is um, I have a, a repo that defines my infrastructure as code. In this case, I'm using YAML files. Um, and all I've done is make a change to a file, commit that file to Git and push up to Git. And I'm using GitHub for this, but you can use any you know standards compliant Git repo. Um, and now I'm going to rely on the Flux tools that are running in my cluster. There's a set of tools that run in the cluster, uh, the operators, that will notice the change in Git and take action on my clusters. So I can force that with Flux. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, reconcile. Um, Sorry, I, sh I should have jumped in there and helped. Yeah, I mean, it's it, the reconcile is the word because it's... <laughs> Yeah, this is this is live demo awesomeness here, John. But yeah, that it's going to what's running in the cluster with Flux is watching the Git repos regularly and saying, okay, any change that's made there, I should apply to the cluster, right? Right. So you'll see here already because I kicked off that reconciliation, I already have my namespace on my cluster. So okay, that's kind of that's great, that's wonderful. It's managed as code. But uh, yeah, okay, I could have done that manually. Where that really starts to pay dividends is when I start to look at how I scale that out. So if I do look at my other staging cluster, you'll see I should already have this namespace here as well, right there. So I didn't have to do any action for these two clusters. All I did was commit my change to code. Now. I'm doing this obviously committing directly to my main branch. You shouldn't do that. You should obviously do pull requests. You should do a have a solid uh, Git flow or GitOps flow or whatever your your flow is for source control. You should be following that. Do peer review and all those things. But for demo purposes, I'm just committing directly to to main. Um, but the the takeaway here is that it's easy to make changes through code and have those changes automatically pushed out to my clusters. Now I have two separate environments. I have both my production and my staging clusters. My staging clusters use a separate uh, branch or uh, directory structure in that same repo, um, but that's great. Like, as I said, this is a really good method for managing configuration across multiple clusters. What this doesn't solve for though is, and I can do deployments. In fact, if I look at my staging environment here, you'll see I have the book info app. I have the microservices demo that uh, I believe Google publishes. I have all of those. I actually have Polaris deployed through Flux. So I'm deploying all of these solutions or all these software packages through Flux. And so, uh, but that's what Flux doesn't do in this case though, is make sure that for example, I have requests and limits set, or that I am not that I'm um, making sure that containers don't run as root, or that I have read-only file systems. All of these best practices that have been kind of kicked around the industry, and everybody kind of I say everybody kind of knows these things, but but there's not really like this definitive list of you know I can run through this checklist and do that in an automated fashion with Flux. Um, so really, that's where. Uh, why Polaris was born and why Fairwinds uh, went through the trouble of building it. So Kendall, you want to tell us a little bit about where Polaris came from and kind of why yeah. the why? Yeah, so, so you know, the as I mentioned, Fairwinds is building and maintaining lots of infrastructure across lots of clients. We see what the macro problems are. And to John's point, uh, you know, what's being deployed into Kubernetes and is it healthy? And we realized as a company, while we're responsible for building and maintaining that infrastructure, um, we can't watch all the time to make sure that everything that's deployed into that infrastructure is healthy. And boy, it would sure save us a lot of headache if the things that are deployed into those clusters are configured correctly. And so that's where Polaris comes in. We said, hey, let's build out a bunch of 
checks so that we can look across things, industry best practices, things that we've learned the hard way, et cetera. And let's uh, put that all together as code. It makes a single place where you can um, check the health of the things that are being deployed into your cluster and then actually stop unhealthy things from being deployed into your cluster. And it also will give you a, a score so that you have some feeling for how you're doing and then give you some specific actions to go and improve things in certain examples. Um, but that's, that's Polaris exists because no matter how great your infrastructure is, if what you're deploying into it is terrible, it's, it's insecure, it's, it's going to cave in, it's all of those different things. Um, and go ahead, John, if you want to talk through this diagram. Yep, I um, appreciate that. So, um, so as Kendall said, you know, Polaris was built from industry experience, from teams that have been running Kubernetes at lots of different customers. So not just one organization. Um, and some of those organizations are not quite as mature and, and some are, you know, maybe on the bleeding edge and a little bit more mature in their process, but we still need to provide the same quality deployment, the same quality of assur uh, assurance, quality assurance, there we go, to to the, the developers that are interacting with the cluster. So Polaris actually has three deployment way, uh, methods that we can use to both audit and enforce best practices in our cluster. So the first is um, just as a dashboard, I can fire up uh, Polaris inside my cluster. I don't even have to put it in my cluster. I can run it on my desktop. Uh, if I want, and connect it to the API. And it's just going to go out and scan the kube API, look at the objects that are in the cluster, and kind of report back on the health of the cluster. And so I'll show that off here in just a minute. It's a really lightweight deployment. It runs in the cluster. It takes very little resources. And it just kind of sits in the background and monitors the API to see what's what's happening. Really good for giving you that score, that health score that Kendall just talked about. Um, in fact, that's actually something they put in the development team puts in the uh, in the top of the report there. Um, in addition to that, though, a lot of a lot of folks are saying, well, that's great, but you know, I don't want, I don't want to just know about problems. I want to prevent them. So Polaris has the ability to also in, uh, act in your cluster, and this has to be installed in the cluster, uh, act in the cluster as a, as an admission controller and as, as specifically as a dynamic admission controller webhook, which will allow us to, when a user tries to create, say, a deployment or a stateful set or a daemon set, it will allow us to compare that against um, you know, our set of, of checks. And if the user is trying to do something that violates our, call it best, you know, our best practices guidance, we can prevent that from being run in the cluster. And so we'll demonstrate that here as well. Um, and then lastly, and that, again, great, right? But we want to know before it even gets to that. We want to know before it even gets applied to the cluster, then we can apply this through a command line utility uh, during our CI process to catch best practices violations during uh, during our CI, during our build. So we can give developers early feedback that, hey, this this isn't even going to be deployable because these you know X, Y, Z reasons. And of course, all that's tunable. There's a, a score that's tunable and uh, you can turn out different checks on and off. You can even create custom checks. Um, so with that, I'm going to jump right into kind of what the dashboard itself looks like. So this is the um, the dashboard for our uh, one of our staging clusters that we showed you earlier. Um, and really it's, you know, it's going to tell us in general, hey, grades B, that's not too bad. And I, I want to emphasize, and this is in the docs, but I also want to emphasize this. If you install this and um, if you install Polaris and you look at the dashboard and um, the, the score is a little bit lower than you were thinking or that you were hoping for, uh, that happens. This is it's designed to be relatively strict from a standards perspective, right? When the Fairwinds team built this, they really designed it to be kind of rigorous, right? Uh, essentially set the bar high. You can always turn those some of those checks off if there are things that you just have to live with in your if your environment or, um, or or customize the checks as necessary. But if you just install it out of the box and you get like a C, uh, don't feel too bad. That's that's a, not an uncommon thing. So if we look at you know here. Let me, let me just add one thing there, John, like for some companies, a C is what you're shooting for, uh, you know, it, it, and, and you're fine with that. And it depends a little bit on a number of things, but you can also go down and dig through the checks that are giving flags and lowering that grade and decide how important those things are to you. And it's and a different score is important to everyone. 
Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, and cool. so we're gonna I'm gonna show that show that here in just a second. So it's gonna tell us a little bit about our cluster. It's gonna kind of give us the summary. And if we scroll down, it's gonna tell us our, we have three different categories of checks. So we have our efficiency checks, our reliability checks, and our security checks. And there's a little bit of description here, but essentially efficiency checks are exactly that, right? Are you are you leveraging the Kubernetes resources you have uh, to their to their full potential? Are you um, are you making good use of the cluster and are you making good use of the, the tools that are available to you? The reliability checks are going to be things like um, looking for health checks and looking for, uh, you know, those kind of those standard foot guns where um, if you don't set these, you're setting yourself up for a failure in the future. And then security checks are going to be things like you're violating security best practices. And I think I saw that in the, the questions. Um, I apologize, we will we will get to the questions, but I saw one of those scroll by. So it does support security best practices. There's some out of the out of the box. Polaris has a bunch of security checks in it. Um, we'll talk through those. Uh, it also allows you to filter by namespace. So in this case, you know, if I don't care about say kube system because I'm using in this case I'm using um, a managed kube cluster, then I can't control what goes into kube system. I have to rely on my provider. So maybe I don't want to filter that. Maybe I only want to look at my microservices demo. So I can filter down by namespaces um, just to look at the at the dashboard. And then if I look here, it's going to tell me a list of all the checks, right? So I have my pod spec, right? Am I using host IPC? And I'm not going to run through all the checks, but you can see this in this particular case, this deployment has, I don't know what's this, about 15 different checks that it's running. And I'm actually violating a few best practices here. So my image pull policy is not always, uh, which is kind of the recommended best practice. Um, my file system is not mounted read only, and um, it is allowed to run as root. So if I were to fix all of those, this would go to all teal, and this would be essentially contributing to a higher score, which um, if we go back and look here, um, I think the only thing in the cluster that has a perfect score is actually the Polaris dashboard itself. Yep. Nice. Way to go. <laughs> if it didn't, we would probably catch endless amounts of flack for that. So, um, so it does have a the the obviously it's following all the best practices. Now, that's great. Again, and this is this is a really good starting point because it's it's easy to install. You can install this if you just want to do you know kubectl apply or Helm install. You do you can install this in like five minutes. Uh, the containers are public. They're hosted out on Quay. Um, real easy to use. You can read the docs, and and again, it, it's about five minutes to get started. Um, but that that really just kind of gives you a, a magnifying glass and helps highlight the problems. Um, if we want to start preventing, it's a good place this, to start. It's a great players. place good to start. Places. That's actually where we would yeah. recommend customers start uh, from yeah. our perspective, right? Audit, understand where you're at, get an assessment. But the next the next step there is really okay. Let's start with a little bit of enforcement. Um, how do we start enforcing? And so in that case, um, we actually have uh, in our production cluster here, um, um, I have, you'll see I actually have the admission controller deployed. And again, this deploys uh, in managed providers just fine as long as they're running. I think it's 115 or 116. They can support the dynamic admission uh, webhook and uh, give you some ah, stupid taskbar. Um, give you some some flexibility there. But you'll see here we have the webhook controller running. Again, small lightweight footprint. The configuration is all passed in uh, via either via config map or via the Helm chart. Um, but the, the admission controller is running. So in this case, if I go back into my um, apps director, I have what I would call a bad app here. You know, just a somebody who didn't didn't follow best practices. Um, we're going to just manually apply that for a second to the cluster. So if we look here, um, it's just a busy box container, and we're going to we're going to say we want to allow privilege escalation. So um, I just so now if I go in here and I say tube TTL apply dash F deploy bad app deployment, and I try to apply that, the Kubernetes API is going to reject that. It's going to reject that because in this case, oh, because I don't have the testing name space. <laughs> Minor detail. Minor detail. In this case, it's going to reject it because it's going to tell me that Polaris um, rejected this because privilege escalation should not be allowed. 
So it's not going to allow me to install this deployment because I'm using a feature, or in this case, a, um, a uh, security spec that is not permissible in my in my environment. So if I want to fix that and go back in here and of course edit my my deployment YAML, I'll go back down here and say, yep, okay, you're right. I don't need privilege escalation. I'm going to turn that off. Thanks for catching that. And if I apply that now, now my application actually gets deployed. You'll see here, I've got a, it's pending, my cluster needs to scale up, but, um, but I've got a container that's pending and will get scheduled. So uh, again, Polaris acting as an admission controller gives you another layer of defense against folks applying, um, applying things to the Kube API that maybe don't, um, don't meet your, your requirements. And again, there's a bunch of security checks that are baked into Polaris out of the box. But there's also a ton of flexibility in creating your own checks. So um, you have the ability, if we, if you go look at the Polaris docs, you have the ability to actually uh, define custom checks and regex matching and things. So for example, if I wanted to block containers from say Quay from running in my cluster, I can do that via Polaris as well. <laughs> so- um, Right, good. Keep going, John. So yeah. well, and, and it's worth pointing out that the admission controller is the last step before something's live in the cluster. And the reason that there's two different spots here, the CI pipeline and the admission controller, in theory, most things go through the CI pipeline. But there might be something where somebody's trying to do something manually to apply it to the cluster, where there's some kind of admin reason to need to go into the cluster directly. And that admission controller can live outside of the CI pipeline and stop something before it gets deployed in that's misconfigured, uh, even if they're going around the normal CI process. But do um, you want to go show the CI part two? Is that part of this as well, John? Yep, yeah, so I also have a, a demo of how we would actually integrate this into a CI uh, pipeline and how we could use Polaris as part of a, um, a pull request style workflow to validate that my application is, uh, or my deployment manifest, sorry, is, is um, compliant before I even start to apply that to the cluster. And real quick, I just, um, I did see another question. Do you define admission webhook in Polaris? Uh, yes, so Polaris actually uses the admission webhook uh, in, and if you go out and look at in the GitHub repo, you will see there's um, there's an admission webhook definition that then references that admission controller that we have deployed in the cluster. So um, so it is using the standard sort of call it def, you know Kubernetes native way of of creating this admission controller. It's nothing nothing fancy or or uh, bespoke. So um, with that, um, real quick, I'm going to pull up my. Um, so I just have a simple pipeline here set to run in um, GitHub Actions. Um, so specifically, and I need to go make my code, my fix my bad deployment. So kubectl delete. Just bear with me one here while I uh, remove our your bad deployment and put in your good one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so here we're gonna go back and we're gonna set this back to uh, to trip our, our Polaris, um, Polaris sure. score. Okay. So if I wanted to, um, so let's say I, I wanted to branch and you know get a branch. I wanted to create a feature branch. Um, we're going to call it JLW, you know, CNCF test, and then I'm going to check that out. And then if I go in here to my in my deployment manifest. Need to make a change here. I'll insert a new line or something. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and now I'm going to push that up to um, up to a feature branch in GitHub. And I have I obviously have GitHub Actions already configured to run um, Polaris 
uh, you know, via this via the CI pipeline. So if we real quick, we want to look what that actually looks like in GitHub. Good news is, is because Polaris is containerized, um, running this in any CI system that supports containers is relatively easy. Um, but here in my workflow, I have my PR workflow. Um, sorry, I actually call it in an action. I have my Polaris action and um, all it does in this case, and this is all obviously hard coded, you would want to pass in environment variables and be a little bit more intelligent about this. But here I'm pulling down the Polaris image from Quay, the one that Fairwinds publishes and maintains for us. And then I'm just going to run Polaris audit and I'm going to pass in uh, some commands. So in this case, I'm going to pass in the um, location of the, the um, YAML manifests that I want Polaris to audit for me. I'm going to pass an uh, exit code on danger, meaning if I get any danger or any essentially critical uh, warnings, I want to set the exit code, I want to fail. And then also if my score is below 90, uh, and this again is configurable, you don't have to use 90, you could use 60 or whatever number works, but so that helps avoid those cumulative, you know, tons of best practices violations, but still allows my developers a little bit of wiggle room in this. So with this whole pipeline, then what's going to happen is on a PR, so I'm going to go into GitHub and I'm going to do a PR and I'm going to create a pull request into um, into main. I'm going to say create my pull request. And it looks like my check already failed. So we're going to go back to my action here. My CI test. I'm going to go down to my, oh, it's running again because I created a PR. So it ran on my commit as well. Um, we're going to go into my CI test. We're going to go to my build step. And here you're going to see that um, this step, uh, my Polaris step failed, and it's going to tell us right here that danger items found in audit. So um, this, and this is all JSON so that you can parse it and return it back to the CI system accordingly. But essentially this is telling me that Polaris found a, a critical vulnerability or a danger uh, in my YAML manifest and thus Polaris failed. So my CI system fails the build. So what I want to do then is go back in now to to fix that. I go, oh right. Um, and if we, and sorry, just to to kind of show where we would find that in here, if we we can kind of scroll through and see all the checks that are happening. So in this case, this this check was successful. This check was successful. All these checks were successful. So we really want to look for um, where. Here we go. Um, we want to look for these, right, where success is false. So in this case, I don't have a liveness probe. It's because it's a busy box container. It doesn't need a liveness probe for testing. But there's another one in, if we keep scrolling here. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that, was, that was of severity warning. That's why that wasn't the thing that actually triggered it, because you have it set to only trigger on danger. And this one says severity danger. Yes. Go ahead. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. So for anybody who's, who's used, um, you know, any kind of sort of, auditing or security scanning tools, this this sort of methodology should look very similar in that we we rate the way that the vulnerability or that the the checks, uh, we rate their severity, and then we can fail on certain types of checks or aggregate numbers of checks, things like that. But in this case, this one was danger and, and we failed, right? So in this case, um, uh, in this case, you know, we'll have to uh, come back in and fix that. So if we look at our uh, app here, so I'm going to go into apps, I'm going to go into my bad app, boy, I'm going to edit this. I'm going to go back in here and say, oh, I, I, silly, I forgot to, forgot to disable privilege escalation. I don't really need to privilege escalate. Why would I ever do that? Um, and then we're going to just check that in. So we're going to get, uh, Push that up to um, what do we call our branch? We called it a feature. LWCNCF test. So now that push is going to then kick off another run of GitHub Actions for us. Right here. We'll wait for GitHub to spin up.
And so now if we uh, go back, Polaris is still running here. So you'll see now Polaris, has, the check has succeeded. I still get the same output telling me all the checks that were run, mm -hmm. but my code is now clean. And if I go back to my pull request, and I look at my CI test, you're gonna see all checks have passed. So now, my, now I know this code is safe for merging into main. Uh, and I could potentially deploy this out to the rest of my cluster, the rest of my uh, the rest of my infrastructure. So again, a standard CI uh, check process, but because Polaris is completely sort of self-contained, it makes it very easy to run these kinds of easy checks uh, early on. And and it, it's really designed to be a really low barrier to entry for deploying this in your workflow, getting started quickly, um, and and essentially not having to understand a huge complex tool chain. Um, for for managing you know simple a, a bunch of simple best practices checks and so with that um, kind of talk about yeah. next steps. So how do I get involved, John? This is such a cool project. Yeah. So if if this is interesting, um, obviously you know the Fairwinds team and and myself and other Polaris users in the community would love for y'all to install it, try it out. And as I said, you don't have to install the admission controller. You don't have to use it all in CI. Just install the dashboard, install it locally, point it at your API on your cluster, let it run an audit. Just try it out, kick the tires, uh, fix issues if uh, sorry file issues, fix them if you'd like to. But file issues if you find them, give feedback. You know, let the developers know. Um, the maintainers know how you feel about it, where where you think it could it could evolve, how you find it useful, and then like legitimately, if if you find an issue and you will feel like you know you're feeling frisky and you want to fix it, please, right? PLs PRs are uh, actually welcome, right? Uh, Kendall, it's, I think you, it always you sounds sarcastic. Yeah, when people say PRs welcome is like, uh, well, you know, up your nose with a rubber hose. If you do want to do better, go for it. But 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 seriously, we would love for the tool to get better and better. This is a very widely adopted tool. There are a lot of people running it in a lot of places. And so because of its community adoption, it is getting better pretty regularly. And we'd love your feedback, your input, um, and pull requests. So. Um, well, thank you, John. Uh, I think it's time to dive into questions. Are you ready for these? I can pose them to you and we can knock them out. Yeah, I think um, so. How would you compare Flux versus Argo? Um, that's a good good question. So Argo, and I, I'm not as familiar with Argo, um, but I, I really feel like Argo is meant to be a, a workflow, a gen, more generic workflow engine. Uh, CI is obviously one of the workflows that it can support, um, but but as far as handling the actual task executions and orchestrating them via Kube, Flux is really designed to be a get a set of GitOp, GitOps uh, tools. And, and again, I'm not not the world's foremost expert on Flux either. Uh, there's a whole there's a whole community around that tool as well. Highly encourage if that was interesting. Same thing, right? Install it, use it, give feedback to the maintainers. It's an awesome tool as well. Lots of use cases for it. Um, but I, I think Flux is really more around. Um, enabling a GitOps workflow and Argo is more of a generic workflow engine. So I think Great. they're, I think they could even arguably even be used in in, uh, in conjunction with each other because Argo really is really good at kind of the GitHub actions portion of what we just showed, right? Orchestrating a CI pipeline, running checks, et cetera. And Flux is really good at taking that artifact that's been run through CI and deploying it. Yep, great. And let's go on to how do you compare Flux versus Terraform, John? So this is probably, I think this is probably a, a more valid comparison um, than Flux versus Argo, at least in my uh, my mind. Um, and you know, they're both describing a desired state. So Terraform uh, is you know describing what you want the, and you can manage all of the things we just showed in Flux. You can also manage with Terraform. The main difference is is that Flux is a pull based operation. So there's an operator running in the cluster that's continually looking at a Git repo and pulling those changes down. Or it doesn't have to be a Git repo. I should be. I should clarify. It can be Git. It can be an object storage bucket. It can be a Helm repo. There's lots of different sources. We used Git for this demo, but um, but there are other sources that Flux supports. And so Flux is more of a pull workflow, meaning that once that change is pushed into your code repo, Flux will handle deploying that to the cluster. So whereas Terraform, you know, as, as I'm sure everybody's aware, you have to actually execute it. Now you can do that through CI. Um, uh, there's maybe yep. some reasons why you don't want to do that, but you can you can what? execute Terraform through CI. 
Um, but uh, sorry, I had to kill my timer there. <laughs> um, but um, but again, I, I think the one's push versus pull is probably the easiest way to contrast them. Yeah, and and, and there are for clarity, um, there are commercial products for Terraform offered by HashiCorp, as I understand, that do address some of the same things, so that there's a way to automatically watch and pull those things in the way that Flux does. Flux is one of the open source tools. It's one that John recommends, uh, and and we're talking about that because this is a CNCF webinar as well. And, and Flux uh, is a CNCF project, so yeah. Worth, worth um, okay, two questions. First, really simple: the Cube CTX CLI. Uh, is that a shortcut for cube cuddle context commands? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah. So kubectx uh, is just a uh, just a real quick. It's just a set of packages. It's kubectx, kubeNS, and a couple other really nifty command line tools. Uh, brew install kubectx on your Mac, and uh, or I don't. I, there's some way to install it on Windows. I don't know what it is. Um, or, yeah. Uh, but but yeah, super handy for um, for uh, just just shortcuts. That's all it is. Yep. Okay. Second big and big the big second big. part of that is is everything as code, your template artifact approach, fitting the much heralded GitOps methodology of handling DevOps tasks related to Kubernetes. Uh, yes. So uh, the answer is, is a resounding yes. Um, what we just walked through is a very abbreviated, probably uh, <laughs> probably butchered GitOps workflow. So uh, yeah. Flux is designed to be a GitOps toolkit for Kubernetes. Um, GitOps is is the workflow that we were kind of discussing here. So yes, there's I mean the very simple bits of GitOps are your entire infrastructure for your operational everything is enshrined in Git as code. That's GitOps. That's uh, GitOps. Now are there way more mature versions of GitOps where certain things pull some ways and other things pull others? Yes, there's a million ways to go really far with this, but at the very base, that's what GitOps is, and yes, that's what we're talking about. Um, Question, this is about Polaris. Do the CI tool, admission controller, and dashboard automatically share a single database of custom checks, or do customizations have to be synced somehow? The short answer of that is um, yes, they automatically share the same database of custom checks. Um, anything to add there, John? Sort of. <laughs> the answer is- Oh, am I wrong about that? Oh my gosh, go, yeah, please correct me. <laughs> so the answer is it depends. Um, the admission controller and the dashboard can share the same configuration because they can pull from the same config map running in the cluster. The um, the uh, CI portion of that, uh, again, I in, in my install, I'm just using the default uh, rules that that are provided from the Polaris team. Uh, if you wanted to then take those rules that that you're using in your cluster and also use them as part of CI, you would have to. Uh, arguably, you should be storing them in Git anyway. So you could just pull them out before you know before you put them in the cluster, but you would have to have to have some way of keeping that uh, the CI system using the same configuration as the as what's running in your cluster. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you for. But that. yeah, well, everything running in the cluster can use the same configuration. Yep. And it's it's not a, a database directly. It's a it's a configuration right. file, but. Um, does Polaris have all the features needed to replace 100% pod security policies and OPA gatekeeper? And I think, I think I'm think i going to try to answer this one, John, and you can correct me again if I get it wrong. Um, the, uh, the short of that is, I mean, there's no such thing as a tool that's going to 100% have all pod security policy, everything. There's not, there's not a tool that's going to do that perfectly because your policy and security needs are going to be unique to you. Um, that said, uh, and and Polaris does not have OPA support. That said, Fairwind's commercial product, Fairwind's Insights, which includes Polaris and other open source tools, Trivi, KubeBench, et cetera, is much more heavily focused on the security pieces and does have support for OPA. So if OPA and having uh, you know an implementation for uh, in the admission controller, CI, and a dashboard is a high priority for you, as well as those additional security checks. Um, there is a uh, commercial product for that. And for clarity, um, there's a free version of that commercial product, uh, but it's not open source the way that Polaris is. So, um, yeah, and I, I'll just echo what Kendall said is, um, uh, you know, does it, does it have all the features needed to replace 100% pod security and OPA? Um, no. There are features in pod security policies and OPA that are not in Polaris, and there are features in Polaris that are not in OPA or pod security policies. It may be, depending on your needs and your implementation, it may be enough coverage for your use case. Um, it may Polaris may not be, right? So you may have to add pod security policies or, um, and, and honestly, 
you know, our approach is always a layered defense is the best defense. So all of the above, uh, as many layers as you can add from a defensive uh, defense in depth perspective is, is going to help build out a more resilient infrastructure. Thanks. Um, are the checks audits customizable by the customer? The short answer to that is yes. Um, and there's a way to write custom checks. It is with uh, JSON and a couple of different things. It's in Polaris, it's not leveraging OPA standards or Rego, uh, Rego, whatever. It's 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 something else for writing those checks. But it is customizable. And which checks you're you're checking are also customizable, right, John? Yes. Yeah. Which checks you run? Uh, again, I just ran it with the default out of the box configuration, which is a pretty high bar, but also designed to be really useful with minimal configuration. So uh, yep. the team kind of took the, hey, let's let's make it as useful as possible, as verbose as possible, and let people turn it down if they don't want it. Um, so that to give you the most information out of the box, um, but but you can absolutely turn it down and use less checks or add custom checks if you need. And, and I think the example I gave, which is is in the documentation, is how to prevent how to have the admission controller prevent uh, Quay.io uh, pack uh, containers from running. So. Um, it looks like the next one uh, is comments on Kubernetes dropping Docker. Ooh, uh, that's an hour long talk all by itself. We're gonna skip that one altogether. Uh, um, so I, yeah, I'm happy to happy to walk right into that one. Um, the takeaway <laughs> on that is, um, you know, the Kubernetes maintainers are doing what they think is best for the community, and uh, and that's that's all that matters. Great. Um, if there is a Polaris admission controller in place and you still need to do some quick and dirty action on the cluster, is it possible to configure the controller to ignore rules somehow? It is. So um, because we're using the sca I say scaffolding loosely, not scaffold like the tool, but just the scaffolding that Kubernetes has for admission controller webhooks, we have the ability to filter out by namespace or filter out by tags, which um, which objects we are going to apply the admission controller to. Now, that being said, that comes with a pretty significant caveat, which is you've now opened up a loophole for people to circumvent your admission controller. So, uh, you know, your mileage may vary on how you actually want to use that. If, if I were in that position, I would probably in that case, just deactivate the admission controller by removing the webhook uh, temporarily. So I would just take a quick, I would just, you know, export that object into a YAML file somewhere, delete the admission controller webhook, leave all the all the tooling running, but just delete the entry that tells Kube to use that webhook, do what I need to do, and then put it back. And and to be clear, you don't need to run the admission controller. You can run it in CI so that if somebody needs to do something quick and dirty, they can they don't have the admission controller running. Like that's yeah. it, it, essentially the admission controller exists so that even in a quick and dirty, you're going around CI and you need to make a change, you're not also implementing some other problem. That's that's why it exists. And, um, and you could you and, it, yeah. and you could actually have the admission controller be a little bit less strict than your CI system. So if you wanted CI, for example, to be super high bar, all of the checks, all of the things, and really you just wanted to use the admission controller to stop people from doing yeah. things that you know are going to hurt your cluster. You could do that as well. You yeah. could run them with separate configurations. Right. All right, um, next one. Thanks for answering my first question. One more, please. Can Polaris, Fairwind Solutions, and Insights provide audit policy enforcement monitoring to vendor specific Kubernetes clusters such as VMware Tanzu, Red Hat, OpenShift, as long as they are compatible with upstream Kubernetes APIs? So that's the question is how compatible are they with upstream uh, Kubernetes APIs? Um, in theory, yes. Uh, in practice, maybe not. John, I don't know. Have you used Polaris in one of in either of those? So I haven't used it on uh, Tanzu or OpenShift specifically. We have used it on uh, different flavors of of Kates. And to your point, it depends on how far from the uh, from the upstream distro they, the, the vendor has deviated. Uh, this the examples we did today. Just to be clear, all of this is running in GKE. So yes. It runs in a vendor, you know, vendor distro. Um, you will see Polaris flagging things that, and you may have to, so you may have to do some additional configuration to Polaris if you're going to use the admission controller to stop it from blocking vendor specific things that may not be up to its standard or that may need to run as root, for example. Um, and you may see it flagging things that you have no control over. Like in, in the case of GKE, I see it flag all kinds of stuff that, that Google installs in the cluster. Um, 
I, I can't fix those things that are provided by the vendor. And there are legitimate, there's legitimate reasons why things are running as root and running with network elevated privileges and things like that, because that's part of the cluster operation. So there may just be some additional configuration required. What I would recommend in that case though, is running the, I would use the admission controller sort of as like a last step. I would really focus on using as part of CI because if your deployment process is using 100% upstream compatible deployment artifacts, then yes, it's 100% compatible with your deployment. It may not be yep. compatible with the deployment that the vendor is giving you in Kube. So let me get through a couple of these relatively quick because we're running out of time. Um, real quick, how is Polaris resource usage on the cluster? It's very minimal. Um, that's the short answer. It's it's not doing a whole lot and it's not a thing that's running and checking constantly all the time because it just doesn't it doesn't need to for that. So it's very minimal resource usage. Um, what are the recommended tools for OPA and talk more about OPA? OPA is the open policy agent. You can go look about it, look, look uh, for that. Open policy agent applies to all kinds of things, not just Kubernetes. Um, it is a standard, one of many standards, uh, but seemingly winning some of the, the standard battles around um, writing custom policy for different things. We um, There are other tools besides Fairwinds Insights for doing OPA, uh, uh, enforcement. Um, some of them are messier than others, uh, but there's there's a lot of community development of this and it's still continuing to, to grow and be adopted. Uh, anything to add to that, John, before I move on? Oh, that's a great summary of OPA. Thanks, Kendall. Um, does GitOps model replace traditional CI CD? No, when you think of traditional CI CD, you're thinking of deploying applications into an infrastructure. What GitOps is about is deploying your infrastructure also through CI CD. So making sure that uh, not just your applications, but also all of your infrastructure code is enshrined as code and being deployed in is, is where that goes. Um, and finally, John, real quick, Kubernetes dropping Docker. Wow, that's news to me. So is Docker being replaced with a what container engine? It is. Um, so uh, there's there's plenty of chatter about this. If you just go search for kube Docker deprecation, I believe it's 120 or 121 uh, Docker, but will not be used as the default uh, or as a uh, as it not as the default, but as a uh, as a container. Uh, runtime engine or CRI. It's been, it's actually been that way for a while. Uh, there's been a shim, Docker CRI shim or something, some such thing that um, that handles making Docker con compatible with the uh, CRI uh, interface. And I, I, I think a container D is probably the most uh, most widely accepted replacement for it. But anything that, that's uh, compatible with CRI um, can, can act as the container runtime environment. Now, that doesn't mean you can't use Docker on your workstation to publish the containers. Just to be clear, right? right? You can still absolutely use Docker build, Docker push, Docker pull on your workstation. Uh, it's just, and and honestly, a lot of the managed kube distros haven't used Docker for a while anyway, so not yep. a huge deal. Can we deploy Flux okay. itself without using? Uh, can we well, deploy that's... Flux using? I want I want to wrap up, John, so I can hand oh. back to Libby to close us out. Good call. So, thanks for the question. Feel free to email John, email me if you have other questions. Also, we had our our. Uh, uh, Twitter profiles in there. You can get in touch with us if you have other things. But John, you did great. Thank you for the live demos. And uh, everyone, thank you for questions. We appreciate your attendance. Would love for you to get involved in either of these projects. Thank you for coming. And Libby, if you want to say anything to wrap up, we appreciate everyone coming. Yes, Thanks, thank everybody. you so much, John and Kendall. Y'all were awesome. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. We will see you at a webinar next year in 2020. The calendar is open. Communications have been sent out, so be sure to check uh, any of your marketing folks in inboxes, and um, we've got some exciting stuff coming up. So thank you both again. Everyone have a great day, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks.